Hello, I'm Kate Fitzgerald from the Learning Hack team, welcoming you to the latest episode of Great Minds on Learning. This season is brought to you by Learning Pool, the company that helps you deliver exceptional performance with pioneering online learning platforms, creative content and powerful analytics. In this series, Donald Clark, the internationally famous author, blogger and entrepreneur, joins John Helmer to explore two and a half thousand years of thought and theorising about learning from the Greeks to the geeks. This episode is about the instructionalists, the theorists behind the modern practice of instructional design and includes the strange case of Benjamin Bloom. So these people that we're talking about today, they're fathers of instructional design. Is that fair to say? Yes, I suppose one exception would be Taylor. Uh, so we're going to discuss him first, because you could describe him more as the father of L&D and organizational development and so on, that pre-war voice, and then suddenly two world wars come along, we're training uh, uh, you know, in, in armaments factories and so on. And then, of course, the rise of the 20th century mass consumerism and so on. So he's less an instructional design, but interestingly had lots to say about it so we'll come to that in a minute but the big name of course is uh, what I call the strange case of Benjamin Bloom uh-huh. <laughs> who is perhaps the most dominant name here and uh, unfortunately I say the strange case of Benjamin Bloom because people pick up on the wrong bit the bit that was wrong and actually all these useful stuff they completely ignore so we'll come to that in a moment but certainly Gagne and Mager are perhaps the two people who, you know, come out in the 60s uh, and 70s with this, out of behaviourism, you know, you have the word stimulus in one of uh, Gagne's nine points. Mm. So they were, they are certainly still in almost every course on inst- your instructional design, if you're looking at the, his nine steps of, uh, 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 of instru- instructional design. And then we have Merrill, who's perhaps the least known, but actually one of the more interesting, because he mm. really is very prescient on the whole notion of instructional design and online learning and wrote a lot about that, a lot of really useful stuff. So, they, but they all have this common core of, you know, seeing learning as a process and not just events or presentation, much more sophisticated view of learning that the learner has to go through, you know, rightly speaking, a process that involves the practice and transfer of learning, not just picking up the knowledge at the front end. Yeah, that's a reference point for me with this, was doing an, an interview early in the um, Learning Hack podcast with Leonard Hoops, who stands up for instructional design a lot. And in that interview, the names that he he dropped most often were kind of Gagne, Merrill, all the people all the people on the back end of, of, of this list. First of all, can you give us a timeline for the group? Um, how coherent are they? Uh, the dates all overlap quite neatly, though, you know, it, it, it's not like with behaviorism where you have a kind of um, big lump with Pavlov, then a bit of a gap before the other people come along. Yeah. Is it a coherent group? It is because, well, it's it's a nice timeline here across a whole century, really. So you have, yeah. uh, we're, we're going to start with Taylor, who emerges, you know, who emerges right at the beginning of the century here. So his principles of scientific uh, management come out 1909. And but just before the First World War, really. Then we have the, uh, the First World War coming along, Second World War, where all this coalesces around the need for training and instruction in a formal sense. Mm-hmm. It's also important to remember that, you know, it wasn't just the World War, it was the Industrial Revolution, mass consumerism, but also the need and extension of education that happened here as well. So we had this massive thirst and need for trained teachers, not only in schools, but also in colleges and universities. So it was this big uh, a need that was created. So that's the beginning of the century, two world wars, mass education, mass industrialization. And then after that, uh, we have Benjamin Bloom, 1956. So in the 50s, we start to take you know, the definition of instruction a little more seriously, trying to base it more on science, mm-hmm. uh, on uh, on the you know that bridging period. Remember, this is just before behaviorism gets destroyed allegedly by Chomsky in 1959. 1956, as Bloom's book is published, mm-hmm. uh, but it was updated decades later by his pupil Laurie Anderson, which most people, of course, ignore. Forget those two pyramids; they they they're just absolute you know they they they're nonsense really. And then we move on into the 60s and 70s with Gagne uh, Gagne Mega. And things 
get more like cognitive science. The cognitive science comes in behind this stuff and then metal and online learning. So it's a coherent group in the sense of it's a nice spread across the 20th century. Okay, so you mentioned education there, conscious of the fact that uh, the, the people who listen to us and watch us on YouTube, uh, many have a foot in the organizational context, but probably just as many are educationalists. Yeah. You think from the name here, they have something to do with educational uh, uh, as well as training. Is yeah. that the case or is the waiting here a bit because of Taylor at the beginning? Yeah. Is it firmly towards the organisational context? What's the mix here? Yeah, well, I've deliberately split this out a little bit because that's certainly true. Although I would say that Bloom has as much cash in education as he has in organisational learning. But of okay. course, there's a, there is another set which we'll do in a future podcast, I would hope. And that, that's Engelman and direct instruction. Very powerful, especially in the US, on the way in which teachers operate in schools. Uh, uh, and then we have Rosenschein and uh, Marzano. There, These are people with taxonomies and instructional methodologies that mm -hmm. are also have a difference. Uh, uh, Willingham bridges theory into practice. You've got Hattie with his long list of what works and what doesn't work in instruction or teaching. That's another force, uh, Black and William and feedback and, and Dweck and growth mindset. So there's a whole other set of educational theorists around instructional design or what we might call teaching, really, uh, which is very, very powerful indeed. And uh, we, hopefully we'll deal with them later. So many learning theorists, so <laughs> yes. little time. More than many people realise, yes. Let's start with Frederick Winslow Taylor. Uh, American mechanical engineer from Quaker stock. Uh, the Winslow is his mother's family. His mother's ancestor came over on the Mayflower, um, one of the original yeah. pilgrims. His father was a Princeton educated lawyer, but he himself turned down the chance to go to Harvard for an apprenticeship. I know apprenticeship's very dear to your heart, Donald. Mm -hmm. He worked his way up to senior management through the, through the firm and made a fortune in steel. He competed nationally at tennis as well, classic overachiever. Having succeeded in business, he then went on to tell other people how it should be done, as so often happens nowadays, in a famous book that has remained enormously influential, The Four Principles of Management. In a sense, he was the first management consultant, and I think people like Drucker still cite him as that. Yeah. Um, so, Donald, what's a management consultant doing in a podcast about learning theory and what were his four principles all about and how do they apply to us? Yeah, well, that was a good summary there. I think, you know, the 20th, 20th century, his book actually was voted the most influential management book ever by the Academy of Management. And that's a good arguable case, really, because he had massive influence, not only in Drucker, but everyone else post-war in terms of the way in which the scientific approach to management had to be taken. Uh, this is incredibly important. Of course, Taylorism is a bit of a pejorative term by, sort of, you know, sort of teenage arguments. It's always uh, brought up in conjunction with the word capitalism as if, as if he was some sort of evil, malevolent uh, devil. But for, this is far from the truth, in fact. Very sophisticated thinker. And if we come down to what he actually said, what's missed out, of course, his four principles. The first one is all about replacing sort of rough rule of work rule of thumb type stuff in apprenticeships with a very scientific approach to tasks and the methods around tasks in industrial processes, factories, and of course, manual work, which was in, and incredibly important at that, at that time. But more importantly for our podcast, I think, he then looked at how one would do this. And his other three principles are all about learning. <laughs> this is what people mostly forget. They're about selecting people, training people, developing people, a rather than just leaving them to train themselves or under, a, the, under the sort of watchful eye of the master apprentice. His third, a, his third rule in the principles of scientific management is detailed instruction and supervision, this idea that people really do need help in their job and they need to be trained to do their job well. And this has proved to be a, you know, perennially true. This is definitely the case. And then I think we have another interesting principle. His fourth one is that relationship between management and workers that both need trained in scientific management principles. Both need to work together to bring this to fruition. So this is a very sophisticated, out of his four principles of scientific management, three are all about training and learning and the workforce. So this is far from the implementation of some, some weird capitalist methodology in treating people as slaves. It was treating people as real people in many ways. 
It is interesting that third principle, provide detailed instruction and supervision of each worker in the performance of that worker's discrete task. I mean, that sounds like it's setting us up for learning in the flow of work, for instance. It, it, it's so often in, in this series, where you, you go, back, go back and look at the past, and you're quite astonished to hear that. I mean, that's something that Bob Mosher could be saying today. And it was there in Taylorism. And Taylor has this kind of, um, as you say, it's become a pejorative term. Um, I th think particularly trade unionism, Taylorism was a, a, a bet noir because it was about controlling every every moment of the employee's day. Um, and we get this as well in uh, what people say nowadays about the Amazon workflow, yeah. um, where Amazon can minutely micromanage every aspect of its employees working day through technology. I mean, people say that Amazon actually played pretty well. Yes, they do. But on the other hand, they're timing your toilet breaks. Um, and it's this kind of incursion of the the company into the life and in, into the mind and psyche of the employee that's kind of objected to. That seems to be a, a, a struggle that's going on now as much as it did in the 20th century. What would oh, yeah. you say about his influence on the place and character of learning, particularly, though, within organisations? He he put L&D within HR, didn't he, specifically, yeah. and educational institutions? Yeah. I think we have to be careful about, sort of, in a sense, blaming Taylor for all this because, you know, you know the pejorative side of Taylorism, as it were. Remember, that most, most work was manual then. You know, that mm. his, 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 his focus on physical processes and so on is understandable because that's what work was for, you know, the vast majority of people. Now, we have the inverse now where most people are not doing manual work, they're doing uh, knowledge work. And so you have much more... Uh, focus on cognitive uh, skills and so on. But that's fine. I, you know, I think it would be unfair to blame Taylor for that. Uh, although we still have, of course, Amazon's a good example and others where, where the physical workflow is still incredibly important. And in many ways, we've backtracked from Taylor, I feel, you know. A, a, his single solution was, in a way, less hierarchical than what many companies I've dealt with over the last 30 to 40 years, you know. Mm. He, he, he recommended a more active role in personal development and supervision of people and managers in that relationship. And in a sense, there's a, you know, we've now had to develop a more humanistic view of management and work because the workplace has changed. But I don't think we can blame Taylor for that. But he's certainly, as you rightly said, perhaps not the father of instructional design, but the father of L and D and HR, I think that's undoubtedly true. Uh, you can actually trace it causally in a sense. Next up is Benjamin Bloom, the strange case of Benjamin Bloom, an educational psychologist, yep. like Taylor from Pennsylvania, but from an immigrant Russian Jewish family, not one of the pilgrim lot, also a jock as well, sweaty yeah. and handball were his things. Uh, worked for the University of Chicago's Board of Examinations from 1940 to 1959, and I think that's a pretty significant um, yeah. part of his bio. Listeners will know him as the taxonomy man, Bloom's taxonomy. That's not all he gave us by any means, but we ought to start there. So, Bloom's taxonomy. Before you tell us what's wrong with it, Donald, can you just fill in what it was and where it came from, importantly, in terms of you know, this series? What were the theoretical roots of the approach he took and what motivated its creation? Three okay. questions. Sir. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So this is 1956. And Benjamin Bloom had a deep interest in, you know, the real world and the application of skills and learning for people in the workplace and in schools, especially. So, you know, the, you know, he had a deep well of knowledge of learning theory behind them. But it's 1956, the tail end of behaviorism, really. Uh, he publishes this book, which, but, but it's only the first of two books. So the first book he has this tripartite distinction between different types of learning. But the first book, which is picked up on, misses out the other two. The first one being the taxonomy of educational objectives, but that was around the cognitive domain. That's in 1956. So people get this book. And of course, because he just published book one, they forget about the uh, psychomotor and effective domains, which is still true today. It's horrific the way in which people are over-focused on text, on uh, knowledge, on the detailed cognitive stuff, as opposed to the effective motivation and psychomotor skills. But mm -hmm. he, even he, I mean, he claimed himself that his taxonomy book, he used to say it was the most cited book, but the least read book <laughs> in the history of uh, learning theory. And I think that's definitely true. You can actually find it free online if you want to have a look at it, but I think that's certainly true because, you know, 99 out of 100 people Actually, when they refer to Bloom, they think of that little colour pyramid, which Bloom never published. It had nothing to do with Bloom, but it became the sort of, in modern day parlance, the meme around Bloom. Mm. 
And of course, it was wrong because it was over hierarchical. It, it demoted knowledge to the bottom of the pile and their knowledge has sat ever since. Now, luckily, luckily, we had uh, Laurie Anderson in 2001, he comes decades later, who was Bloom's pupil. And uh, he had to go back and read the book, interestingly. And he said, well, no, this is ancient. This, this is all wrong, this. And so he changes all the nouns, the, the nouns being things like uh, knowledge, comprehension, application analysis, synthesis, up to the top, which is, I've got evaluation. So those are Bloom's taxonomy, okay, the classic Bloom pyramid. And he changes them and switches them around to remembering, understanding, applying, analyzing, evaluating, and creation. So completely different set, really. And uh, But that was also often represented in the pyramid, which Laurie Anderson disagrees with as well. People are obsessed by pyramids, whether it's Maslow or, uh, or Bloom in L&D, and the pyramids are usually wrong. So what Laurie Anderson did was improve upon the original taxonomy by changing it someone, changing nouns into verbs to make them more active, which is what teaching and learning is. Uh, but he also hated this idea that knowledge was at the bottom of the pile. So he changed it around so that, because learning is a much messier process than most of these step-by-step -step instructional design people think or present to us. And what Laurie Anderson said does is quite clever, I think. He says, listen, this is really useful stuff, but you've got to see knowledge as being marbled like fat into the meat a little, a little <laughs> bit, you know? It really does help your all levels of learning. You know, you're all constantly using this. So in mathematics, for example, you might learn your basic times tables, but even when you're doing your GCSE or A-levels, you're using the knowledge of that, you know, automaticity of your timetables all the time when you're doing maths or basic rules and algebra and so on. So this idea that it moves on from knowledge all the way up to being very creative step by step is just a complete fallacy. And it, it, people love it because it looks great in PowerPoints. I think that's why it's existed in the really terrible courses, you know, train the trainer courses or, uh, you know, train the teacher courses, for example. If you see that, I mean, you really should, you know, speak up when you see that pyramid because it's wrong. Who built the pyramids, Donald? This isn't a question about archaeology but <laughs> this is a flawed model and the, yes. the, the the graphic of the the pyramids specifically i think yes. you're saying that bloom himself didn't sit down on a sketch pad and nope. and draw that out and give it to a graphic designer they, they, this came after him i mean so the, i mean the question being here it's flawed model how do we account for the flaws did bloom get it wrong himself or was his thought misinterpreted by others sounds no, like it's be, well, where's okay. the smoking gun here well there are two two components to this i think first of all Bloom did overemphasize the hierarchy in a way, but which Laurie Anderson corrected. And, and Bloom's alive. I mean, he agrees with this. So mm. it was alive then. So I think Bloom mm. actually overemphasized the steps, never came up with the pyramid. But what happened with both Bloom and Laurie Anderson and pyramids was exactly the same thing that happened with Maslow, who also never came up with the pyramid. In fact, the text, if you read it, is non-pyramidical. <laughs> it's, it's really peculiar. What happens is you have trainer trainer courses and people who synthesize stuff mm. and they're starting to teach on slides and from books and PowerPoints and so on. And they like these schemas and they like these pyramidical schemas, but something even more insidious happened with Bloom because remember we have book one, which is just the cognitive domain. And because a teacher training, for example, takes place in universities, you get this massive overestimation of the cognitive domain compared to motivation, feelings, attitudes, which are more mm. relevant in the workplace, but also relevant in learning in schools. And we've had to live with this for decades. You know, it got too academic and not only academic, it sliced the cognitive off from the rest of the learning side. So this is the fault really of the people who began teaching instructional design or teaching teaching. <laughs> and in the trainer world, of course, it just got captured like a meme very early on. I can remember it way back in the early 80s, 70s, you know, those triangles popping up everywhere. Mm. And uh, once they're in a PowerPoint, and they look good because they're colored like the rainbow, then like children, you know, we just accept them as being right, never questioning the fact that it was never in Bloom's book in the first place. Hmm. Before we move on to the other stuff that he did, which in a way it, it's perhaps more interesting, yeah. let's just loop back to part of that original question. What were the roots of his approach? Where, where did it come from? Was he a behaviorist? Or? No, not really. I think to be fair, you know, when you look at just the cognitive domain, which he focused on, then you can tell by that word, even cognitive, that he had already transcended crude behaviorism in many ways. And mm -hmm. one would not call Bloom a behaviorist. Uh, and, but I think we must also remember that it wasn't Bloom himself. Bloom was on a committee. He was the chair of the committee that wrote this book. And the book was co-authored by a guy called David Crathwell. 
And Bloom never claimed that he was the sole author of this. He was really the guy who synthesized the thoughts of many mm -hmm. psychologists in the day. This is a really important point. It's not really Bloom. It's a sort of general consensus that yeah. these are the things that matter in learning. And you find that, as you see, as we go through Gagne and so on and others, they're pretty much pretty much of a muchness. You know, they, they follow a, a, a quite sensible path from very basic knowledge through to more sophisticated stuff and practice and transfer at the tail end. Mm. And we'll see that emerge as we talk. Yeah. But uh, so uh, uh, this is a group of people who, had, who were coming out of behaviorism uh, into, the, into the cognitive side. That's why the cognitive domain book was published first. Okay, so there was a need for it, which was kind of general. He would have been aware of that in, yes. in his post at University of Chicago. It needed a taxonomy. Learning needed a taxonomy. Yes. Um, learning technologies, in my view, still needs a taxonomy, <laughs> isn't it? Yes, yeah. Good question. Terribly skewed by one analyst view or another. So a taxonomy is a necessary to, thing to have in a knowledge field. And yeah. he, he saw this, but it, it, it was kind of generally that he was responding to. I, I think that's that's really interesting. There's, so there's one, not other a thing, sorry, one other thing I would add there, John, it got fossilised. There's a good way of describing fossil. 1996, yeah. we've had dozens of good taxonomies, better ones since, from people like uh, uh, D. Fink, Wiggins, McKay, uh, Davis and Ardent, uh, Belbin. You know, there are, there are some really, really lots of much more sophisticated work done since. But people are incredibly lazy in learning theory, I think. And, you know, once something gets fossilised in the system and on PowerPoints, especially if it's a pyramid and coloured, then it stays there forever. And I'm sure... Literally today, there are literally thousands of train the trainer courses of that pyramid about to be launched on us again. He's not a pharaoh. Let's not bury him entirely under his pyramids. <laughs> There's plenty more to Bloom, isn't there? Oh, yeah. Now, the funny thing about the strange, I gotta say, the strange case of Benjamin Bloom is it's his other work is far more interesting and has far greater longevity, in my view. So, I mean, his other research led him. Which, which looked at things like human characteristics and school learning. You know, this wasn't just about organizational learning. And he was a big fan of what one might call mastery learning. Mm -hmm. And what this means is he looked very carefully at one dimension, and that's time, and understood that in schools, what really held people back wasn't the distinction between people who were good and bad or smart or stupid. It was actually just the time taken to completion. So if you give people enough time, then eventually they'll get there in terms of the competencies they need to do a job or in the academic context or whatever. And he said, this is, this is crazy, isn't it? All we do is filter people by time, not really their ability to do anything. So he proposed three things that could make mastery learning fulfill this sort of potential if we take away the variable of time. You know, that early diagnosis and adaption, and I was, let's understand what people are like when they come into a particular learning process and mm. to diagnose and predict and recommend what they can do. This is a big deal now, of course, with LXPs and recommendation engines and adaptive learning. We should also address their maturation. I was asked going through the learning journey, you want to personalize and adapt things for them so that they go at the right time. You know, the people who get the stuff go quicker. Why are they learning the stuff they already know? Uh, and the people who need the real help and are failing get the right remedial feedback so they move on in a steady manner and might take longer. And then he was a really big fan of changing instructional methods. Uh, around to match different types of learning experiences and time. So these three things, in a sense, pluck the variable of time out of the equation and allow people to move at their own pace with good support that's personalized for them. So that he, I, you know, Bloom in a funny sort of way is the father of personalized learning. Uh, Google's, uh, you know, head of research, Google, uh, Peter Norvik used to famously say, there's only one paper you have to read if you're in online learning. And it's called uh, the Two Sigma Problem. And it, it's really worth understanding what this paper said because it's so important. The Two Sigma problem compares the lecture formative feedback with a lecture and one-to-one -one tuition, okay, three groups of people. If you take the straight lecture as the mean, he, he found about an 84% increase in mastery above the mean for this formative approach, okay? But you get a 98% increase, a huge difference, in mastery for one-to-one -one tuition. So one-to-tuition tuition, one tuition is not only better than lectures, it's massively better so that, that's what the two sigma refers to on, on, uh, on standard deviation. So we're already, he, he does a piece of research that shows the one-to-one -one personalized learning is massively better. Now, at the time, he didn't have the technology to do this, but he was onto something here. And I think that paper, you know, I've talked about this a lot in my book on mm -hmm. AI and learning, how really the use of AI and adaptive learning and personalized and LXDs and, and the use of data and learning really fuels this Bloom's vision of taking time out of learning 
and making it massively more efficient for the, for the many and not the few. The system is still massively geared towards the few. Any school is really still geared towards producing people to go to uni, as, and then the rest are fairly well abandoned, as we know. So I think there are great lessons to be learned, learned from him in this. The way we work has changed, and the way we learn is changing too. But 70% of organisations don't feel that their learning systems can really cope with all this change. It seems there is a disconnect between what learners need right now and what most learning suites provide. In a new white paper, Ben Betts and I tell the story of how this disconnect happened and lay out a vision of what a modern learning system ought to be and do. It's called Sweet Dreams and you can read it now. In his valedictory speech at his high school in 1932, Robert Mills Gagné professed that the science of psychology, which he intended to be his life study, should be used to relieve the burdens of human life. He went on to Yale and then to Brown, where his PhD thesis involved the conditioned operate response of white rats. People who caught our previous episode on the behaviorists will recognize that language. Mm -hmm. And here's a weird sort of pattern, because several behaviorists, I remember, started with rats or dogs and then wanted to go onto people or started going onto people, but something was seemed to interrupt them. Watson got fired. Thorndike was prevented by his university, Harvard. And in Gagné's case, what got in his way was World War II. But it's interesting because the military training becomes an, a really important um, part of this whole story. Gagné pioneered the science of instruction when he was working for the Army Air Corps training pilots. This set him off on a course of occupational training being a big part of his work throughout, although he had a lot of academic posts as well. Later, he codified this in his writings, and like Bloom, he had a big hit, his nine events of instruction. Join in if you know the words. Donald, tell us about the nine events. Right, okay. There's, again, an excellent summary of his background there. I mean, this is a guy who comes up in the, the middle of the 60s, Conditions of Learning, 1965, right through to Domains of Learning, published in 1972. So 60s, 70s type stuff, very much influenced by military training uh, uh, in terms of the way in which good instruction happens because it mattered. People died. You know, that, there's that old line about, you know, why, uh, you know, uh, 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 about pilots. Why do we use simulations with pilots and give them really brilliant training? Because they go down with a plane. <laughs> in other contexts, learners don't go down with anything. You know, you can get away with the poor instruction and teaching. But before you come to his, he's famous for his nine instructional steps. But before you come to that, you have to understand that he did a lot of good work on categories of learning, a bit like Bloom's taxonomy. Mm, and yeah. because that's, a, that's what these nine steps were based on. And his five major things were an expansion, you may call it, you know, a ballooning out of Bloom, because he believed that there were, you know, sure, there are intellectual skills, classifying things, problem solving, all that uh, critical thinking and so on. But he thought there was a bit of an overemphasis on this, which I agree with. And he looked at cognitive strategies, especially their use in, a, uh, in the appropriate applications that may be in an apprenticeship or any learning context or in the workplace as a manager. So he was good on cognitive strategies, but then he comes up with other dimensions to learning, one being verbal information, such an important skill. You know, if you're hiring salespeople or you're teaching, uh, then verbal skills really start to matter uh, in terms of the not only teaching, but learning. And then there are motor skills, of course, that whole physical performance thing that you need to know. And then attitudes. He brings attitudes in. The, the, the bit that Bloom's, well, Bloom's second book covered this, but the bit that was missing there. So intellectual skills, cognitive strategies, verbal, uh, verbal skills, verbal information, motor skills and attitudes. Okay, that's the basis. He then uses this to build his nine steps of instruction. Uh, and this is what, of course, he's better known for. And it's a very odd nine steps. It's a very odd nine steps indeed, some of which are very good, others I'm not sure about. So just very quickly, so we understand what, the, what these nine steps are. You've got the first one, which is gaining attention, you know, that, that making things feel urgent, getting the learner in a state where they really want to learn. That's good, love that. Unfortunately, it's so often some really hokey icebreaker or something, you know, like it goes down like the Titanic, in fact, uh, or some horrible, the history of or wrong introduction. His second one, which people normally put first by mistake, is stating the objective. And here you still have that feel of behaviorism, you know, stating the objective, getting the learner to understand what they, what they will be able to do as a result of the instruction. And this has launched a thousand, thousand dull uh, you know, here are the objectives of the course slides in every. At uh, the end of this course, you will be able to. But I mean, that will be very familiar to anyone who's kind of yeah. suffered through some badly learning. 
And I think, yeah, exactly. And whether it's in a classroom or at school, university, whatever, like, you know, that's, that's, that's Gagne, I'm afraid. And uh, he's, he's there along with Mega, who we'll cover later. Uh, but so that's, I don't like that so much. You know, I think that was just, uh, you know, that now should be, uh, we should get rid of that. The third one is stimulating recall prior to learning, which is a nice thing. Get the learner to appreciate that they do have some existing knowledge normally. You know, they come to the table with something. That's good because new knowledge has to be wedded into old knowledge. And then, the fourth one is oh, presenting the stimulus. Again, you can just hear the language, hear the language of behaviorism here, presenting the stimulus, and that's yeah. exposing, exposing the learner to content. So actually, when he unpacks it, it's fairly reasonable. Give them some content. And, you know, I don't just don't buy this content doesn't matter any longer. We can look it up on Google. It does matter. And Gagne really emphasized this, uh, the step five, uh, you know, that content thing. And then... Six was eliciting performance was what he called it. And that's getting the performance to demonstrate what they've learned. And that's really important. This bridge uh, uh, between presenting content and then getting the learner to through retrieval practice, generative learning, deliberate practice, but other 101 things one would want to do, getting them to do their own work, think hard, effortful learning. This is making it stick. You know, all that stuff comes out of this Number six in Gagne, and I, that's where all the action should be, but so often isn't. We get so stuck on the presentation and content. Too often you get a kind of uh, gratuitous drag and drop as the learning designer. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. Into, I mean, yeah. you know, you know that, you know, three heads appear as cartoons. Click on Peter, you see a speech bubble coming up to see what Peter thinks of the Data Protection Act. Completely infantile and banal. But, uh, you know, we have to look at much more sophisticated. I just finished a whole book on learning experience design, which talks about moving us on into much more serious types of learning away from this drag and drop and click and, and you know, in infantile stuff. So I, I, I think that's important, number six. And then number seven, of course, providing feedback. Who would disagree that this is... Feedback is really feed forward, propelling people forward in the learning journey. I think that really matters. And Gagne identified that, that as number seven. And then assessment, assess the performance. You really have, you know, people don't like exams, but there has to be some way of deciding whether somebody can go and operate on your body, <laughs> repair your car or whatever. And I think assessment does that. Not well, but there are other ways of doing it, perhaps, than the current methods, because uh, we tend to assess, especially in e learning, just the cognitive domain. Mm -hmm. uh, and then nine, is the one that everybody misses, which is maybe the most important of all. And we've talked about this in a previous podcast. And that is in most learning experiences, people forget almost everything. <laughs> Ebbinghaus is the forgetting curve. It comes back again to haunt us, Ebbinghaus. Yeah. And of course, Gagne nicely includes number nine, his step nine, which a lot of people know, enhancing retention and transfer. Enhancing retention and transfer to other contexts. So it's getting the learner to practice things, retrieval practice, you know, looking away and thinking, yeah, what, you know, coming, bringing it back into your mind, rehearsing it, applying it for real and worked examples, doing it on the job, writing essays, generating new, uh, generating material as a way of remembering stuff. So that it really does stick with you, not in the exam tomorrow, but three months down the line, a year down the line, especially if you're in your job. And this is what this whole new in the workflow thing is really picking up on is mm. Gagne's later points about the transfer of learning. You know, it's much easier to transfer learning when you're delivering it in the workflow, in the place, in the context, and which is going to be used at that right point, at the right mm. time, to the right people. So okay. we're getting, a, a, unfortunately, the bit of Gagne that sticks with everybody's stating objectives at the front of a course, when his most important point is number nine at the end, which is you going to make people learn and apply it in the, in the real world. I don't always get to number nine. But just a reflection, it doesn't, from as, you know, as, as an old marketing person, it, it's a similarity, a superficial similarity to aid structure, which advertisers use: get their attention, engage their interest, um, motivate desire, and then you lead on to action. Um, there's not much about desire here. In fact, there's nothing really about the effective domain here. And I, you know, the kind of Nick Shackleton Jones jumping up and down at the back of the room here, I, th I think, would um, have something to say about that. There, there's nothing in these nine events which talks about engaging emotion. Yeah, well, to be fair motivation. to Gagne, yeah, that's a good point. But to be fair to Gagne, and Bloom in many ways, you know, Bloom did go on to write about it later, but that's the bit everybody ignores, so it wasn't Bloom's fault. But right. with Gagne also, to be fair, remember going back to his five categories of learning, number five is attitudes. And what he meant by right. that is demonstrating preferred options. And, you know, he, he was... He was quite sophisticated on that side of motivation and learning as well. He wasn't ignoring it. But what, and, and in actual fact, there is a weakness in these instructional design processes because teaching isn't 
te- the difference between teaching and learning is teaching is creating the context for learning, you know, creating the motivational context. And so, you know, the people who stress the effective and motivational side of learning are absolutely right. Most teaching effort goes into that. Mm. Most learning is a very personal experience, cognitive experience. Uh, you know, you, that, that deep interest that you have to have in the learning, the effort you as a learner have to, have to make. So there's a danger that instruction becomes everything, teaching becomes everything, forgetting that teaching is only a means to an end. And mm. most teaching is actually about creating the context for teaching Heidegger, I sorry, bring it such an easy. He's really good at this. He has a brilliant section where he talks about the teaching is much more difficult than learning because you have to sort of let the learner in. You have to stand back a little bit. Good teaching is all about that. Leave room for the learner to become engaged with that part of their life. And so these instructional methods sometimes, you know, you might think that instruction and teaching is all. It's not really. The vast majority of what we learn in life is. Through, you know, through through doing things in our workplace, almost incidental, informal, accidental. And the great danger here is that the view that everybody has to learn through teaching is far mm. from the truth. You know, yeah. we, 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 we tend to keep that to the front end of our life and don't go back to it because uh, actually we learn to become more autonomous. Okay. So the, the, the nine events was a big influence on e-learning design. I've had it quoted back to me by learning designers so often. Yeah. And I believe that Gagné had some involvement with computer-based training himself. I believe yes. that would have been the 60s, a so kind of mainframe environment, yeah. University of Illinois kind of stuff. But some say his influence on e-learning design has been for the worse. What do you think? Yes, there is some truth in that, but only because people tended to ignore the bit. They took the bits they wanted and ignored Cherry number picking. nine, you saw, so, as I said earlier. But there is something about the mechanical nature of a step-by-step process when learning is much more complicated than that. It's much more iterative and messier in many ways than Ganyu would present. So you, you get this very mechanical, you feel that when you're taking your learning courses, that it's a, a bit like a manual. It's very instructive, <laughs> whereas learning tends to be, as, as we've rightly discussed, more to do attitudes and motivation and feel, and that's often missed in that. So I think there's certain a lot of truth in your observation there, there, John. That's certainly true. This is you know, we'll come to Merrill later, who's much more sophisticated in terms of his influence on online learning and still largely not known and ignored. I'd much rather people learned in online learning looked at Merrill than Gagne, for example. So Robert F. Major, make, Major or Major or Major, Major? Yeah, was, yeah. yeah, was it tomato or tomato? I don't know. Yeah, good point. Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> I'll look it up on the uh, I'll get pronunciation unit to, to yeah. kind of school me next time, Donald. Sorry about that. Yeah. Another psychologist from Ohio bullied at school for being not only precociously bright, but also left handed, a keen banjo player. And I wonder if he played that left handed because he actually learned to write right handed. Also drafted into the military, died only recently in May 2020, just shy of his 97th birthday. So Guy Wallace, who I know listens to this podcast, contributed memories of working with him to a valedictory webpage yeah. and remembers him as a perfectionist. He liked to yeah. get things right. And um, he made Guy rewrite the thing he was doing something like 30 times. One of the things he got right, Mega, was the work he is most known for on drafting learning objectives. Donald, it doesn't seem like the most earth shattering thing to be known for of drafting no. learning objectives, but really it's pretty crucial, isn't it? Well, it is. If it is, you know, I, find, I find Mega quite fascinating. He has the greatest title for an autobiography I've ever heard, which is called Life in the Pinball Machine, Careering from There to Here, which I think yeah. sums up almost everybody's life. <laughs> it's yeah, a great it stands title. out in the instructional literature of this era, doesn't it? It's an interesting <laughs> it does, title. Yeah, uh, for being brutally honest. Uh, yeah, that's great. So many autobiographies are not honest. You know, it's just the good bits. But I think... Yeah, he's, he's known, I mean, he's much, it was, you know, much wider. All of these people had much wider research interests and in, in mm-hmm. writing than, their, than what they were known for. And he gets narrowed down for preparing instructional objectives. And I, I've got the book and I can remember it was one of the first things I read in this uh, arena. And that was published, uh, the first edition, way back 1962. But really, it was the 70s where it grew in the 80s, it got a grip. But again, like Gagne, people forget there's a background to this stuff here. You know, uh, you know, he had a, a whole load of stuff that would come to on criteria reference instruction, you know, which was quite sophisticated, very mm. sophisticated, in fact. It might be worth just touching on that for a moment before we come to the objectives thing, which is a result okay. of that. Much less so, catchy title, criterion yeah, reference yeah. instruction, than the, the, the pinball one. 
That's right. This is, you know, these tend to be written for academic audiences very much. So they feel as though they have to sound serious. But the criterion reference instruction was a sort of framework, set of methods. And that was really around, it's a detailed analysis, a process of analysis, which is why Guy Wallace is right on this. We're throwing out analysis for, you know, empathy and all sorts of abstract nouns. But you really do have to, if you're designing learning, you have to do some quite detailed upfront work. And just dropping analysis for a general set of feelings about what the audience are like seems like madness to me. But the criterion's reference in, uh, induction was based on five things, really. And the five principles are really very sound. One is competencies. Like, understand, if you're going to be designing training or learning or education or something, understand what they're going to be doing here, you know? What's the nuts and bolts here? Where are things difficult? What are the, what are the blockages? You've got to ask people, you know? So it's all very well a 23-year-old having empathy for plumbers, <laughs> which I find amazing, uh, amazingly ridiculous. But actually what's more important is that you speak to some plumbers about where they have problems and what they actually do when they're plumbing. So there was that competencies. Then the scope, you know, in other words, be very careful about taking people too quickly, too far. Identify what level, what level of mastery was the word he used there uh, that was required by the objectives. This is why objectives are important. You know, the scope of the learning is defined by the objectives, quantifiably. And then he has practice, again, the bit that's always missed out by people and the bit that was missed out was in Gagné. Uh, but practice learners have to really practice knowledge and skills uh, if they're going to get anywhere and get feedback about uh, in terms of moving forward. And then, just like Gagné, the bit most instructional designers miss out in focusing on learning objectives at the first of the course is the importance of reinforcement and transfer. Again, so you've got sick in the 1960s, like Gagné, he says it is really important that you focus on reinforcement, reinforcement of learning, retrieval practice, face practice, uh, deliberate practice. And then a, a really nice one, which I really like, is his fifth one, and that's autonomy. The idea that the learners have to have some freedom to choose, you know, in the learning process, make them feel as though they're engaged with learning in some detail. This is really important, I think, giving learners the freedom and, and not sort of, you know, you know e-learning's quite often like putting on a shirt or suit that's three sizes too for you, it's too small for you. You feel constrained by it. So this is not right. I'm being, I'm just on a train here that's taking me somewhere, whereas actually I want to be in a car and choose some of the destinations myself or the route by which I, I take things. Mm. So I, I think, you know, that was in, uh, in Mager. So he's a much more sophisticated people, uh, person than people think. And then we come to his learning objectives, the only thing he's known for. And they're quite sensible, actually. The danger is they just got taken and slammed in the front of course in that sort of weird trainer, dull trainer speak. So the first thing you get in the course is, I mean, you know, I often say, you know, imagine going to the movies and you go and uh, you're going to see a film, let's say the Titanic. And, you know, you get a little, the, the objectives of this movie is uh, one of the world's biggest ships sail from Southampton with 2000 passengers it disastrously hits an iceberg, almost everybody dies, but we'll throw some romance in to keep the movie going. And you go, are you kidding me? What, you just told me the whole movie. You just told me, why are you doing this? Why are you That's boring me with this? I don't want Can't to- you have seen that. trailers like that? <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> yeah. You'll laugh, you'll cry, well, you'll reassess your whole worldview. You know? That's right. It's like that's, a set of learning objectives in a sense. It is. It's almost like behaviorism, is it? You will be like a rat. You will get this from this movie. Whereas actually people don't want that. They don't want the mystery reveal. They don't want spoilers. They want the experience to mm. be fresh in their mind and to wed it into existing knowledge. So it's learning, come back to his learning objectives for a moment. They're designed to determine the outcomes of learning. And that's they're focused on the end point very much, but that's no bad thing. There are three things. One, the starting point is the conditions for learning. Conditions for learning. So an object an objective always has to state these conditions under which the performance is to, go, to occur, okay? So mm -hmm. that's you looking to the future. You know, what tools, assistance, assumptions uh, are you going to make? And that's normally the word, given that X, Y, Z, then we will learn X. This is okay. quite an important thing, understanding prior knowledge, what you need before you go into the learning experience, the conditions of the objectives. That's normally given, given blah, blah, blah. The second one is the actual performance of competence. So the objective is obviously what you specifically, really specifically expected to be able to do. And this is really useful for instructional design. What does the plumber have to do when he is replacing a washer in your tap? There are four or five things that you really need to know. And they're step by step. It's nitty gritty detail. People often don't do enough analysis on that. And if it's a bit vague or misses something, the result of the doing. And then the third one, is the one that perhaps he's more famous for because it's sharpened up objectives, and that's the criteria. What are the criterions? Given this, and that you do X, 
what's the criteria for success here? And these criteria, of course, have to be measurable in terms of uh, time and output. And so given these three things, conditions, performance, and criteria, you can define the end point and then start, defi- start designing your stuff back from this hmm. in a, a meaningful way so that it hits the target. It all sounds quite worky. Does, uh, does that apply to the educational realm? Or is well, very yes, much that's right. There are lots of doing stuff. words in all this, you know, and yeah. uh, these learning objectives were, were written generally for learning across the board. But I think that's quite important because... I think they apply equally as well to an academic task. You know, if I have something to do, I'm trying to think of something. So, so I was on a, a plane yesterday, the first post-COVID. So I was on a plane and I was writing a rather esoteric thing on Jacques Derrida and learning, okay? But hmm. it was a really complicated task, but I knew what my end point is. I'm going to write a, very, a short one-page blog on Derrida. I know how many words it's going to be. I know what the audience is. I know that hardly anybody will have read Derrida or even heard of him. So I've got the given, I've got the criterion, and my my you know my actual criteria for performance will be to make it readable, to make it relevant at an X amount of words, and I know where it's going to be. And I, I even thinking about how I'm going to retweet it and so on. So even on very esoteric tasks, I think that it helps uh, if you're doing things in the real world. You mentioned something really interesting earlier and stuck in my mind there, uh, uh, John, which is its similarity sometimes to marketing. So having worked a lot with marketing people, especially recently, there's a lot of truth in this. You know, good marketing chunks things down. It, uh, it's very clear about its objectives, what the brand is, what the objective and selling is. And then it's very clear on the messaging you need to get there. And then it's very clear on the channels you use to get to those people. So, you know, the conditions, given X, what people like out there, a lot of analysis of your audience, given the performance, they have to buy X or do X or watch this movie. And then also, what are the criteria by which we judge that, you know? I Mm. think very similar. Nice parallel. Working with the same psychology. It's easier for marketers, though. Um, As somebody once said, there's no buy button on a learning course. Um, All you've got to do is get people to buy this stuff. Yeah. Uh, educators, have, I, I think, have a harder job, but you know, yes, I, I, yeah. I think it's a good point. Yeah. Um, so, is that all to say about Mega? Do you think? Yes, I think. I think my recommendation for people would be to look at his criteria for reference instruction because that's you know the you know always when you always look at these learning theories in the, yeah. the wider perspective because I think you know, there's more to them than meets the eye. That's certainly true with. Bloom, where I actually I think the stuff people don't know is far more interesting, has more longevity than the people the stuff that people do know, which is wrong. Mm. Uh, and the same is true of Megar, I think. Yeah, but uh, yeah, there's a theme here. Um, there is. You, you need to read these people, um, and what's wrong with their their kind of legacy is that nobody actually reads them. <laughs> yes, and I think in a sense these podcasts are about giving people a shortcut there. I mean, it's a lot of work to read this stuff, you know, and it, it, and it, so there's no hand, harm in you know listening to a podcast like this where somebody's done the reading and looked at the evidence and so on and and tried to, and, and and we're putting it into a shape where it's accessible for most people who wouldn't have the time because they've real you know they've full time jobs. Uh, uh, we're acting as translators for that in many ways, yeah. We do the hard work, folks, so you don't have to. Yeah. The marketing person, me, of course, wants to go to a call to action, so subscribe. <music> Moving on to M. David Merrill, uh, yeah. the last of this group. Now it brings us up to date in the sense that David Merrill is still, still among us. He's yeah. also explicitly an expert in and guru of instructional design, unlike some of the others, and yeah. has been heavily involved with design of online learning himself because he, he comes into the computer age with us. Uh, a Mormon from Ohio with nine children and 39 grandchildren. I've, yeah. I've only got one, 39, wow. He's held numerous academic posts and is responsible for three important theories that, according to Wikipedia, underpin the discipline of instructional design and technology today. The component display theory, yeah. instructional transaction theory, and the first principles of instruction. So, Donald, yeah. let's get into Merrill. Okay. So which one of those do you want to do first then? The uh, component display theory or, or instructional transactional theory? Up to you. I feel that we're giving people a load of things like component yeah. display theory, the nine events, the you know, the the, yeah. the, the kind of bloom stacks on me. It's very much a feature of, of, of this particular group, isn't it? But yeah, it I is. mean, hit them any way you want or ignore any that you, you don't think we're talking about. Up to you. 
Okay. Well, again, on this, well, that's a good point. So bringing out this theme of there's a great deal of commonality between them on, on principles of instruction. Let's start mm. with that one, because uh, Merrill Merrill had his own principle of, of instruction, which were quite different from the others, and were more heavily influenced people like Shank and so on, because he he was really a much more problem centered person and liked to focus much more on learning by doing than the others, and uh, who were a more emphasis in the cognitive domain. So problem centered, you know, teaching towards real world tasks and problems, going from the simple to complex using worked examples and so on. That was his game. Uh, but but then going back to instructional design, like the rest, you have to get this activation of prior knowledge, you have, you have to get them to recall prior knowledge, get them to recall prior knowledge. This allows the new knowledge to be integrated with greater ease. So that, that idea that you're bringing the new stuff into an existing context is in all of these people and was emphasized uh, by Merrill himself. Then get people to shore demonstrate knowledge, retrieval practice, generative knowledge, all that stuff. Again, it was not all the rest, but he's there with demonstration, show, demonstrate knowledge or skills in the real context, in the workplace or in an essay or whatever you're meant to be doing uh, based on what research shows work well, uh, or sort of research that does work well. Remember, he's massively influenced by real detailed cognitive science at this point okay. uh, and, and comes to the party a bit later and therefore it takes that much more seriously. And then there's the application of learning, one of his first principles. So we have problem-centered activation, demonstration, application, do it for real. Learners need to demonstrate the knowledge or skills, demonstrate that they can perform it almost in a form of assessment. And then integration, a really interesting one. You know, you have to actually start integrating this knowledge or skills through reflection, discussion, presentation of new knowledge to your colleagues, applying it in the workplace. And here we have this whole notion of transfer again. And this brings in this whole, you know, new learning in the workflow, learning experience platforms, learning record stores, that idea of moments of need, the right stuff to the right time at the right person, and, you know, that, that integration into the real world and your real life, which is the ultimate goal of learning. So that, that so he has these principles, you know, like everybody, the first principles of instruction. He then, this is the basis for his instructional transaction theory, which is a, what he's probably best known for, I think. And here, he suddenly gets involved in what was emerging then, you know, in the 70s, 80s, and that as learning technology. And really, hmm. really pressing. I think he really was a forward-looking guy and that he saw where technology was taking us before it had matured. And he makes a really important distinction that is import as important today as it was then. There is phase one of instructional design, which is by and large around presentation of experiences, video, you know, text and graphics with multiple choice questions. That's by and large what e-learning is still in. That's the paradigm. And he called that, uh, he really thought that, that was the first phase, uh, the first generation of instructional design, he called it. And he thought that we should be moving towards the second generation of design. And that's based on much more sophisticated technology that mediates learning rather than mm -hmm. presenting stuff to people. And the mediation of learning through the algorithms that draw on content and data, this is the Merrill thing. And he's, this guy is just amazingly ahead of his time. Mm. Uh, and yet, you know, speak to your average instructional designer, and this is the, probably the name in the list they know least. Uh, yeah. but, the, but the people who are really in the know know their Merrill because he, he knew what he was doing here. Now, what he does is quite interesting on analysis. This brings us to the third thing, which is his component display theory. Mm. So what he does is he has this interesting grid that he builds. On one axis, you've got content, things like facts, procedures, concepts, principles, all the different types or taxonomies of learning, as it were. And then in the other uh, axis, he's got types of performance. So one performance might just be able to simply recall something, let's say a piece of knowledge, but it's quite different from recalling to actually use it in the real world or find or problem solve. So what he does is have this grid of content and performance and matches out. He thinks that... This is an incredibly useful way of designing optimal learning experiences. Now, I wholly agree with this. In fact, I've just been an amazing project where we've actually built this for real using AI. So I will actually using very sophisticated mathematical model where you have all the inputs on types of content there are about 150 types of delivery mechanisms from simple text, uh, you know, a little PDF right through to advanced VR with coaching and so on. So if you have all these down one axis and then you use very clever maths to optimize those delivery channels through the types of performance that you expect, then I think technology is starting to do what Merrill wanted us to do. And that has come up with an optimized learning journey uh, based on the right selection of content that matches the right type of learner, 
and the right types of learning. Once you've got all those things, nobody can do this in their head. So technology has to do this in the end. Mm. And that's what these more sophisticated algorithmic LXP adaptive learning systems are starting to do. They're taking all that pedagogy, building it into the models and doing what no human can do. And that's optimize learning for the individual. That sounds really interesting, Donald. And this might be, I might be massively getting the wrong end of the stick here, but what it, what it kind of feels like to me is an instrumentalized ontology or taxonomy, which brings us in a loop back to Bloom in a, in, in a sense, yeah. in that you're kind of taxonomy, taxonomizing different types of learning, but in a way where you're kind of mobilizing it through, through that grid. Very interesting. I noticed yeah. in the description of uh, Merrill's work on your blog, Donald, the phrase knowledge objects comes up and he talks about yeah. two dimensions of content and performance, which is, you know, um, yeah. interesting as well. This might be, again, might be completely left field, but can we blame him for SCORM? No, you can't really, because the sense in which Merrill uses that word learning object is very different from the sense in which a reusable learning objects came into the SCORM world. So an ADL okay. 20 years ago, and I, I knew those people were, you know, was there when it happened. They rather oddly, so this is the reusable learning objects, RLO people, which are different from Merrill. Right. They, they thought that learning was like Lego. And if you just build lots of little bits, you could recombine them like Lego into any course you wanted. That's why SCORM is as s- stupid and hopeless as it is. Yeah. So all it does is say, you've completed this little Lego block. What do you do? You know, it doesn't even say what you do next. So it's all based on just very simple data. Who did what where? Who did what and when? Did they finish it? <laughs> End of story. This is a hopefully impoverished, impoverished view of data. But that was caused by those people. Actually, if they had followed Merrill, they would have got somewhere because he has a much more sophisticated view of this based on learning theory. It's not just about have you completed this little bit. It's what this little bit is in the bigger picture and how it plays a role in optimizing learning experiences going forward in a learning journey, Hmm. which is quite highly structured. It has to be using all sorts of complex things that he had in his kit bag, you know, problem solving, demonstration, all the stuff I, I said on his first principles of instruction and application integration. He was much more sophisticated than that group. That, that group were, it was pretty Mickey Mouse, to be honest, the, the theorizing around this stuff. People were desperate for a little standard for data on LMSs. We came up with SCORM and it still was stuck there like a horrible bottleneck. Thankfully, the world is freeing itself from SCORM, moving towards XAPI uh, and because we are having to look at learning as a data-driven process to realize all those wonderful things that we know about learning. So summing up, something that seems to be a common theme here with this group is finding principles in a particular field, such as training pilots or running a steel company, whatever, that you then extrapolate and make general across all or at least many subjects and business sectors. You know, this is what we look to theorists to do, is to generalise, I think. We see a lot of turning away from so-called traditional instructional design um, in the world now. It's even been renamed a couple of times, so it became learning design. Um, Now it's becoming experience design. And a a lot of stuff just simply gets forgotten. People, as you say, people don't read the stuff. Is part of the problem that these ideas are rooted in particular contexts, then applied as generalities, but then the context disappears. As you say, you know, Taylor's stuff was all about manufacturing. We don't do a lot of manufacturing, at least in this part of the world anymore. And the generality of the principle then tends to decay. Is it, you know, does it really translate to knowledge workers? Is this stuff written in sand or do people just need to pay closer attention and read more? I think it sounds like maybe the latter. Yeah. Well, I, I think you came up with the answer to your own question there, John. And yeah, I too think often I, do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's a good thing. It you, means you're probably right. Uh, <laughs> I think, yeah, these things, what we tend to do is focus down on one little bit that's easy to comprehend, capture on a pyramid or on a little list like uh, Bloom's Taxonomy or Gagne's Nine Steps, and then that's it. We forget them all. Uh, And in actual fact, what's happened is, I think the opposite of what what you've said there, what's happened is that all the theorizing, Bloom's cognitive list, Gagne's steps, the thing that people have picked up on because it's easier to implement is all the cognitive stuff. Yeah. As you rightly said, what they tend to do is underplay the effective emotional, motivational stuff and also the learning by doing and the retrieval practice, space practice, application uh, uh, of whatever you're learning. So what we've had is a, an over 
you know, academic view of all this, whereas what these people are constantly telling us, and they're all pretty much of a oneness on this, is that all this other stuff really matters. And yet what we consistently do is just pluck out the bits we like or are easy to implement. So in, my, in the, the book I've just finished on learning experience design, I, I, you know, I'm just urging people to say, no, this is not about the presentation of experiences like movies or whatever. Learning is a complicated process. We've had a good century of reflection on this. We have 2,500 years of reflection on it. Let's keep it as complex as it is and deal with the reality of learning and not some abstract, simple, cognitive knowledge only over academic model. Now, mm. these people were all in favor of that. You know, they, we, we've just selected the good, the, not the good bits, but in many ways we've selected the bad bits and ignored yep. the good bits. Mm. So that, and also, I think it's important also... Teaching is a funny thing, you know, it's not, it is not a serial process of step-by-step -step instructions where you move on from basic vocabulary to this, to this, until you get to some abstract thing called creativity, whatever the hell that is at the top. And this type of thinking is also coming out in 21st century skills, which just seem like, you know, more academic abstract nonsense. And I think we have to take learning seriously, look at the, what these people were doing is folding in the cognitive science, the good science behind learning and trying to make it real. And that's a thoroughly good thing. Hmm. You know, instruction is really the backbone of formal education and training. It, it's really important to know how people learn, you know, so that we can actually teach them or allow technology to teach them. But it's also important to learn how to teach, which is what a lot of the instructional methods were all about. The ones hmm. informed by others, it's a real dialectic. But to say that the best, you know, some people just default back, well, best practice and teaching is an art, you know, it it's not a science. Let's ignore all this cognitive science. It and so they're immune to all this theory and theoretical construct, but that simply begs a question. Well, what is best practice? You know, if, if it's an art and there's good teachers, what, are what does it mean to be a good teacher? That simply begs a question, what is good practice? Hmm. And these theories give us answers to those questions. In teacher really? training, uh, that's why you have to embed this type of stuff, you know. So there's a lot of very rich stuff here that needs to be paid attention to. This one has been particularly interesting in comparison with the, the last couple of episodes we've done on the cognitivists and behaviorists. They were people whose work was touched a variety of fields, you know, largely psychologists. Yes. Um, and they had this bit of their work that was about learning or, or, or could be applied to learning. This group are all about learning they are you know specifically yeah. kind of instructionists you know right. with the possible exception of, of taylor and, and that's been really interesting because it kind of brings it a, a, a lot closer to our to our world the real um, yeah I'd, i've got a, a typical rounding up wrap-up question here lastly if you had to boil it down to a few points that learning professionals should take away from the study of the instructionists what would they be but as a result of this i'm, I'm really scared to ask that now because i'm thinking if you really boil it down, do you just end up with another pyramid that, you know, falsifies what is actually a large and rich body of work you should be going back to? No, I think what you end up with, first of all, is let, not a pyramid at all in the sense of a strict series of steps with the, the in a hierarchical fashion that demotes or devalues knowledge and shoves it at the bottom of some abstract pyramid that the original author never drew anyway. I think what it does is widen your perspectives. It mm -hmm. takes you out to realize that learning is a journey and a process that needs the application and all that tail end stuff of knowledge. You know, It's not just about the presentation, not just about teaching. You have to be very, very sensitive to the theory of learning. So all these people were very sensitive to how people learn before they came up with their, uh, you know, their instruction method, instructional methodologies. So there's that widening out but more importantly for me is getting away from that overemphasis on just words, multiple choice questions and drag and drop, you know, that sort of right, rather crude knowledge-based stuff. Because in the workplace, we learn a lot by doing. We need to apply knowledge. We need to retain it in our heads to apply it in real different contexts and problem solve and so on. And so this newer world that's emerging, I think, is quite exciting, is more loyal to these theorists mm -hmm. than the, the existing 20, 30 years of e-learning that we have gone through. It's taking it more, it's taking the wider perspective of learning more seriously around the application of knowledge, the transfer of knowledge, the importance of retention or the bottlenecks around cognitive load and 101 things that have that are new to us. 
And if we just rely on learning experiences as events, learning as an event, which used to be the classroom view of learning, or learning as an event online, watch this, that's it, then we're making a big mistake. We have to learn from these people a century's worth of experience and research showing us that it's a much more sophisticated, in a way messy, but a wider enterprise. Thank you, Donald. No problem, John. That was interesting. Uh, thanks very much for, for doing it. This season of Great Minds on Learning is brought to you by Learning Pool, a company that helps you deliver exceptional performance with pioneering online learning platforms, creative content and powerful analytics. For a wealth of valuable free white papers and resources on learning, visit learningpool.com forward slash downloads. Great Minds on Learning comes from the Learning Hack team and is produced by John Helmer. Sound edit is by Isaac Peacock. Social media by Jay Curtis. The podcast is based on a series of blog posts written by Donald Clark and would like to thank Donald for his kind collaboration in this project. Our next episode focuses on practice. James, Dewey, Erickson and Bjork.